Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the 19th Pointer Lecture. A special welcome is extended to those of you who have joined us from overseas and for helping to make this an international occasion. This invited lecture is organised by the British Society for the History of Medicine and was first established in 1983. The lecture is in honour of Noel Pointer, who was a distinguished medical historian and director of the Wellcome Institute of the History of Medicine. It is appropriate that Dr. John Ward delivers the Pointer Lecture in 2020, the year in which the centenary of the death of Sir William Osler is marked. John Ward is not just a distinguished Oslerian, but he is past president of the British Society of the History of Medicine and of the Osler Club of London, a distinction that he shares with Noel Pointer. John Ward was born in Edinburgh and graduated in medicine from St. Andrews University, where he met and subsequently married Ruth. John informs me that he became absorbed by Osler at the age of 18 when he purchased a copy of Camac's Councils and Ideals. Before retiring, John practiced in Abingdon, Oxfordshire, and made significant contributions as the GP trainer and researcher in family medicine. On sabbaticals, he visited um, various academic posts, visited uh, various academic posts in the USA, where he lectured on family medicine, Johnsonian subjects, and medical history. John is a past governor of the American Osler Society. He was chairman of the organizing committee of the 2014 International Osler Meeting in Oxford. And with Ruth, he organized the Osler Centennial in Oxford earlier this year. John has lectured widely in the UK, North America and France. John and Ruth have shared research interests and both have been heavily involved with the new Osler Encyclopedia. John, Thank you for agreeing to give the 19th Pointer Lecture. We very much look forward to your lecture. The Great Republic of Medicine knows and has known no national boundaries. William Walsler, the great medical internationalist. Thank you, John. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a privilege to have been asked to deliver this lecture. Sadly, I never met Neil Pointer, though I'm very familiar with his huge role in British and international history of medicine societies. He was, of course, a founding committee member of the BSHM, and as its president, he organised the London Congress in 1972. Before that, he was president of the Osler Club of London from 1965 to 7 when his secretary was my old friend Jerry James. The OCL and the BSHM have been very important influences in my life for many decades, and it's good to know there are so many long-standing friends in the audience. Today has been an opportunity to celebrate the role that Sir William Osler played in the history of medicine and commemorate his passing on the 29th of December 1919 and his funeral in Christchurch, Oxford on the 1st of January 1920. People in multiple countries have come together to mark these anniversaries. The corpus of work on Oslerian themes is huge and the recent publication of the huge encyclopedia Osleriana has increased this. In choosing a subject to address the audience, I have chosen to look at Osler's international outlook, his travel and his activities. Given the enormity of the subject, I shall have to pick out speakers and items I consider particularly relevant under speaker's licence. Sir William's ancestors were Cornish seafarers. His great-grandfather Edward may have been a seaman or possibly even a pirate. One grandfather, another Edward, was a Falmouth shipowner while a third Edward, William's uncle, was a naval medical officer who wrote The Voyage, an epic poem, and his life of Lord Exmouth. 
a biography of a Cornish admiral. Young William would have read these as a man growing up in Bond Head, Ontario. His father, the Reverend Featherstone Osler, a missionary, had spent ten years in the Royal Navy before moving to Canada with his young bride. So William was well schooled in the knowledge of travel by sea and was to become very well travelled himself and it's been estimated that he crossed the Atlantic at least 32 times over his life. And there is a multitude of letters in the Osla Library, all bearing the headings from various ships. The first trip followed his medical graduation at McGill. He realised that medical knowledge was international, and with the monetary support of his brother Edward Boyd Osla, a financier shown here, he headed to Europe for 18 months to study medicine, physiology and pathology in London, Paris, Vienna and Berlin. Originally, he had hoped to become an ophthalmologist, but he was discouraged from this by a mentor, Dr. R. Palmer Howard, who suggested that he should cultivate the whole field of medicine to become an outstanding general physician. In London, he worked on the platelet in Sir John Burden Sanderson's laboratory, but it was his meeting with the great pathologist Rudolf Virchow, shown here, in Berlin, that set his destiny as a great clinician and teacher. And these trips clearly influenced his views on medical education, which were to be put into practice years later when he became foundation professor at Johns Hopkins and integrated the curriculum to combine the best aspects of the British clerkship method, the French skill and the German more scientific approach. At the same time, he developed his skills in observation and his increasing knowledge of medical history and literature and his admiration for past medical men from many lands was developed. Years later, in chauvinism in medicine, he was to write, Full knowledge, which alone disperses the mists of ignorance, can only be obtained by travel, or by a thorough acquaintance with the literature of the different countries. So he saw medicine and the endeavours of its practitioners as an international cooperative movement and brotherhood for the common good. He accepted that there was room for proper pride of land and birth, but he disliked medical nationalism. He wrote, What I inveigh against is a cursed spirit of intolerance, conceived in distrust and bred in ignorance, that makes the mental attitude perennially antagonistic, even bitterly antagonistic to everything foreign, that subordinates everywhere the race to the nation, forgetting the higher claims of human brotherhood. Sir William was very well travelled and attended multiple medical meetings all over Europe. It's been an interest of mine to try and find out what his linguistic abilities were. Clearly, he was not a linguist in the strictest sense. His reading knowledge of German probably began during time spent with a William Oldright, whom he got to know through James Bovell, his mentor and teacher at Trinity College, Toronto. Bovell relied on Oldright to translate works in German and Italian into English. And so Osler credited his reading knowledge of medical German to Oldright's stimulus. Oldright later became professor of hygiene at the Toronto Medical School. As a postgraduate student, Osler spent the last few months of 1874 in Berlin and was later to write, The universities of Germany are her chief glory. In his travelogues, he mentions 15 German cities, if one includes German-speaking cities such as Vienna and Strasbourg. Though many conversations took place in English, his working knowledge of German was such that at the age of 25, he was able to translate a German medical article into English and have it published. He formed lasting friendships with Germans such as Ludwig Aschhoff, shown here, Friedrich von Müller and Karl Sudoff. 
During the Great War, he made sure that his son Revere carried with him a letter addressed to Muller, which might have helped had he been captured by German troops. After Revere's death from wounds caused by a German artillery shell, Osler, unlike his wife Grace, refused to harbour a deep resentment against the German people. After the war, as the victorious allies sought revenge, a plan was under consideration in Paris to make the Germans and Austrians seed cows and goats. Knowing the starvation conditions in Germany and Austria, Osler had much correspondence on this with the Foreign Office and Robert Cecil, the UK representative in Paris, in which he pointed out the plight of the children in the defeated countries. Alice Hamilton, a former student, visited him in Oxford as part of a Quaker mission to give aid to Germans. She had come and visited, fearing that Revere's death might have made Sir William bitter. But he found that his, she found that his thoughts were on the starving children, and he gave her letters of introduction. And later he wrote to her, saying, For heaven's sake, don't let them take the cows away from Germany. In the Osler Memorial volume, J. Ludwig Ashoff, in a fulsome tribute entitled Sir William Osler, an Apostle of International Medicine, highlighted Osler's many strengths and particularly his kindness. He concluded thus, I, a German, deeply convinced of the value of our own culture and science, do reverence to the shades of a William Osler, who was one of the great bridge builders in the field of medicine beyond all national boundaries. Here he produced works which the war itself could not destroy. William Osler belongs to the medicine of the world. And amongst the obituaries of Osler written in German, there is one by Muller, who called him a warm friend of German medicine, and another by Carol Friedrich Wenkebach, who acknowledged Osler's assistance to war-torn Vienna. We should note here that though Osler's textbook was translated into German, its impact there was less than in the English-speaking world. I haven't been able to confirm that Osler ever studied French in a formal manner, but he clearly had some competence in it, though indicated that he found some conference speakers difficult to follow. However, his time in France during 1908-9 probably improved his grasp. We know that he took advantage of a sunny autumn to thoroughly explore Paris in the company of a student from the École des Chartes, who served as his guide and French tutor. Likewise, he probably picked up some Italian during his three trips there, notably the lengthy one in early 1909, so beautifully covered by Luca Borghi, in his recent book, Osler and Italy, an intermittent love story. Now, looking at the classical languages, he had studied some Greek and Latin at school, and additionally, while he was at Johns Hopkins, he had a friendship with Basil Gildersleeve, the distinguished professor of Greek at the university. In his last and presidential address to the Classical Association at Oxford, in May 1919, he said he was not an educated man in the Oxford sense, yet faint memories of the classics linger, the result of ten years of such study as lads of my generation pursued, memories best expressed in Tom Hood's lines. The weary tasks I used to con, the hopeless leaves I wept upon, most fruitless leaves to me. In fact, given Osler's intense work in producing Incunabula Medica, he clearly had some ability to get a general sense of what he was reading, while at the same time relying on his Oxford friends, and notably Gilbert Murray, the Regis Professor of Greek shown on this slide, for accurate translations. And on this theme I find it amusing that Sir William signed petitions on different occasions, both for 
and against compulsory Greek for admission to Oxford. Let me now cover two items of relevance to Osler's international legacy. Firstly, he endures because of eponyms associated with him. In the article in the new Osler Encyclopedia, entitled Eponymy, William Osler and, Charles Bryan and Nadine Tudayen list e elegantly the current criticisms of eponymy. Their conclusion is that, despite the more than a dozen syndromes or signs associated with Osler, the most clear-cut instance in which he deserves the name attribution is that of Oslerus Oslery, a dog lungworm, since he described it clearly, the pathology of the associated disease, the symptoms, and a causative organism. Yet, it's not an eponym, but actually the name of the organism applied according to Linnean taxonomy. They admire, however, the term Oslerian age, created by John Andrew Kenny to denote an era of radical medical process of which progress, of which in many ways Osler was emblematic. Despite these 21st century criticisms, we must acknowledge that Osler admired the way French physicians honoured those who had served their day and generation and made frequent use of eponyms, especially as a form of shorthand. The index of the first editions of the Principles and Practice of Medicine contains 140 eponyms and more were added in later editions. Charcot, incidentally, has 25 references. The second great Oslerian legacy to be considered is the above book, published in 1892, which was to make him famous throughout the medical world. In the USA till then, probably the best known books by American authors were Austin Flint's Treatise on the Principles and Practice of Medicine, first edition, 1866, and the multi-authored System of Practical Medicine by American Authors of 1885-6, edited by Osler's friend and Philadelphia colleague William Pepper, and to which Osler had contributed sections of, on diseases of the blood and blood glandular system. There were also several multi-authored European books and the standard single-authored English textbook, Lectures on the Principles and Practice of Physic, by Sir Thomas Watson, which had multiple editions between 1843 and 1871. Osler's magnum opus was written from September 1890 and published in 1892. The speed of his writing such dis elegant and descriptive prose on the whole field of medicine, with classical quotations, eponyms and references, underlines his capacity for work. However, he had taken advantage of the smooth running of Johns Hopkins Hospital and the clinical work of his excellent juniors, Henry Lafleur and William S. Thayer. And as the opening of the medical school on, was on hold for financial reasons, his teaching and administrative load, administrative load was light, and being a bachelor was probably an advantage at this time. The book was a huge success and the first printing of 1892 of 3,000 copies sold out in two months. The second printing in April 1992 corrected errors, including the famous misspelling of Gorgias as Georgias. By this sixth edition of 1905, 105,000 copies had been printed, and over its amazing 16 editions and 55-year run, over half a million copies were sold. The seventh edition was the last to be written solely by Osler. The eighth of 1912 had Thomas McRae as his co-author. Justifiably, Harvey Cushing described it as the most used and useful book in medicine. It was translated into French, German, Russian, Spanish and Portuguese, and the latter two reached Argentina and Brazil. Thanks to the Edinburgh graduate Philip B. Kusland, it was translated into Chinese and was the first Western medical textbook in that language. 
It is remarkable to me that in the 1892 edition of the textbook, Osler referred to the use of acupuncture and also commented on some diseases indigenous to the Orient. <coughs> Pardon me. In his splendid book, Osler and Oriental Medicine of 1982, Richard L. Golden, MD, the late president and archivist of the AOS, discussed various Chinese areas of interest and also the introduction and growth of the Oslerian tradition in modern Japan. We should note that in 1968, Dr. Masakazu Abe, Professor of Medicine at Jikai Medical College, Tokyo, designed the bronze medal shown on this slide with its obverse and reverse inscriptions to give to his fellows, recognising signal achievement in academic research. In 1948, Shigeaki Hinohara, who some will recall attending the 2014 Oxford Conference, wrote a life of Oslo. His love of Oslo was inspired by the gift of a copy of Iquanamitas after World War II. Hinohara, a great and influential physician, was to become the founder of the Japanese Osler Society. I should mention here a major result of Osler's textbook. In 1897, Frederick Taylor Gates, a Baptist minister, an advisor to John D. Rockefeller, read the book while he was on vacation and was so affected by it that he used his influence to persuade Rockefeller to establish the Rockefeller Institute for Medical Research in 1901 and later through the Rockefeller's Foundation General Education Board to upgrade North American medical schools and encourage the growth of full-time clinical facilities. This is analogous to the massive benefactions of William Morris Lord Nuffield in Oxford and through the UK, which were influenced by the relationship between Osler and Morris. I describe these in the encyclopaedia in an entry entitled Morris, William Richard, 1st Viscount Nuffield, 1877-1963. Morris, a sufferer from various medical conditions, would never consult a doctor unless a copy of Osler's textbook was visible. In the first edition of Iquanimitus of 1904, which was a collection of his inspirational addresses, Osler recommended medical students to start at once a medical library and spend the last half hour of the day in communion with the saints of humanity. These were as shown on this slide. Now, the, Osler's choice of books was drawn from his wide knowledge of international literature. And though not all of his suggestions, with the exceptions of the Bible and Shakespeare, would find favour with students today, we must note that in the list the writers wrote in classical Greek and Latin, American English, French and Spanish. That doesn't mean to say that Osler read them in the original languages. To me, this accords with his advice that the true student is a citizen of the world, the allegiance of whose soul, at any rate, is too precious to be restricted to a single country. I now wish to look at Osler and his fascination and respect for French medicine and its heritage. His relationships in and with France was covered in detail, were covered in detail, by Charles Curie in his erudite and comprehensive oration to the Osler Club of London in 1966 during Noel Pointer's presidency of the club. Charles Curie was born in Egypt. He gained his medical degree from Paris and later became professor and chief physician at the Hôtel Dieu in Paris, before devoting his interest to the history of medicine. In 1893, in his memorial notice on the death of Jean-Martin Charcot to the Johns Hopkins Medical Bulletin, Osler had written, 
The man in France stands for more than in any other land. His work and worth are there, more truly recognised, and there his relative position in the history of art, literature or science is most justly gauged. Alone amongst the nations of the world, France honours the mighty dead of our profession. He continued and noted that there are more statues to medical men in Paris than in Great Britain and the United States put together. The story of Osler attending an international congress in Paris in 1905 and leading a group of Americans who included A.C. Klebs to the tomb of Pierre-Charles-Alexandre Louis in Montparnasse, where he delivered an address and laid a wreath on the 5th of October, is well known. I covered it in my lecture on Louis to the OCL and my keynote lecture to the Anglo-French Medical Society in Nantes in, in 2015. Osler's longest visit to France started on the 1st of October 1908 with the intention of a few weeks brain dusting, but as Marguerite Chapin, the niece of a friend, had decided to winter in the USA, she lent the Oslers her furnished apartment at 44 Avenue Jena, one of 12 avenues radiating from the Arc de Triomphe. This enabled the stay to be extended for three and a half months to the 15th of January, 1909. Revere joined William and Grace Osler for his Christmas holidays, but this was by no means a holiday for Osler, as he threw himself into a multitude of cultural, social, touristic and medical activities. While in Paris, he tended to avoid the, uh, uh, the American colony, though he did have his portrait painted by the American artist Seymour Thomas. Before the university opened again in November, he assiduously visited the various Parisian libraries, looking at rare editions and interesting manuscripts. In the École de Médecine, he was given a room to browse 16th century books. On Toussaint, All Saints' Day, he again laid a wreath on Louis' tomb, and also on Bichard's grave, this time in Père Lachaise Cemetery. He also attended lectures at the Sorbonne, and finished revising his Principles and Practice of Medicine, which had been published in French in 1907, as a translation by Salomon, who was Landougie's chef de clinique. And this also had a short preface, by Pierre Marie. Inevitably, Osler spent full days in the hospitals and clinics, making contact with eminent French doctors, who became his friends, and being absorbed in the local French scene. His clinical opinion on cases were much prized and respected. He was entertained royally, and on the 11th of December, at the Medical Society of the Paris Hospitals, after giving a paper on chronic infectious endocarditis, he was elected by acclamation a corresponding member of the society. Interestingly, later, in 1914, he was to be given the same honour by the National Academy of Medicine. He, his very positive views on French medicine were honed in 1908 to 9. He was particularly interested that French medical educators valued hospitals attendance above classrooms, and he lauded the humanism and courtesy of French doctors, particularly noting their very friendly dealings with even the most humble of patients. His gratitude to his French friends was displayed in 1909, when he denote, uh, donated a copy of Vesalius's Tabulae Anatomicae Sex to the Library of the Paris Faculty. Again, in December 1917, a few short months after his beloved Revere's death, he decided to bequeath a valuable copy of Ambrose Paris, Anatomie Universelle du Corps Humain. 
On leaving Paris on the 15th of January 1909, he reminisced and expressed his regrets at his departure, noting that he would have happily been a member of the Faculty of Medicine there and worked with and under his French colleagues. For their part, they much liked and respected him. The announcement of his death to the French Academy by its president, Lavermain, ended thus. William Osler was an eminent clinician, a remarkable professor, a writer who is justly renowned for his clarity and precision. He was furthermore a likeable man who was most affable and counted very many friends. His death is a great loss for medical science and in particular for Oxford University. In the name of the Medical Academy, I extend my most sincere condolences to the family of our illustrious colleague, whom we greatly miss. This was unanimously approved. In his editorial entitled Osler, Educateur, in the Osler Memorial volume, Pierre-Marie noted that Osler made a marvellous educator. He concluded that he was not only a great doctor, but was also one of the elite, and that we have all admired and loved him. In 1999, 80 years after Osler's death, the French medical historian Daniel Gurevich, writing in The Lancet, predicted that in future there would be wide replacement of doctors by technicians. She called Osler the last maître à penser of a noble-minded generation. In 1911, Osler took the opportunity to visit Egypt. He joined his brother Edward Boyd, the wealthy financier, who had arranged a lavish boat trip with Thomas Cook and Sons for Canadian friends. Grace did not accompany William, as she hated heat and dust, and anyway did not want to be so far away from Revere, who was at school. On his way to Egypt, William reached Naples via the Train de Lux, whose carriages, he said, were only fit for the scrap heap. But all that trauma was forgotten in Cairo, the cathedral library, Gizeh, and the hospitals. Writing to W.S. Thayer at Johns Hopkins, he wrote of seeing ankylostoma specimens and commented that management was impossible as everyone had bare feet, so spread was inevitable. Similarly, Bilharzia was even worse and the hospital had a score or more of bladder cases and many of the intestinal form. Gloomily, he reported on the poor public health measures and disorganised clinics. He took pleasure, however, in seeing a portrait of Theodor Bilharz, the German helminthologist, in a library. The group then set off on a luxurious launch, the SETI, for a month-long cruise of the Nile, organised by Thomas Cook and Sons, with stops for excursions to temples, pyramids and tombs, often on donkeys. This slide shows Osler on the right-hand side of the left picture and, of course, on top of a donkey. Osler enjoyed Luxor and the Assam Dam. In, in Assam, he visited the Hospital of the American Mission, which had 200 beds and 20,000 outpatients. He extolled Karnak. And throughout the whole trip, Osler sent myriad letters and cards to Grace and friends, in which he detailed the climate, the sites, boatmen, and his observations on medical and bibliographic Egypt. Unusually for him, he wrote long letters, which indicate to me that he could have been a travel writer. He found Egypt a, a revelation with an, its intellectual development over six millennia. In a letter to Fluelis Barker, he said that he'd just come from paying his respects to 
Dr. Imhotep, the first physician with a distinct personality to stand out in the mists of antiquity. Osla said, Egypt has one god, the sun, and two devils, dust and flies, the latter being responsible for two-thirds of the disease. Ophthalmia was rife and awful, and there was much blindness. Back in Cairo, he searched libraries, then went to Alexandria. On his return, he took the boat to Naples and wrote down his medical observations, particularly for a revision of his magnum opus's section on parasitic diseases. He did, however, see Sorrento, Capri and Pompeii on the way back. His visit to Egypt was a great success. Sir William's capacity for work is an amazing characteristic of his life. He himself said that his master word was work. He took the term master word from the character of Mowgli in his friend's Kipling's Jungle Book. In 1912, he prepared a revised edition of, edition of his textbook, and though Macrae assisted him, he nevertheless was mostly responsible. In 1912-13, to 13, he served as president of the British Hospital Associations and toiled to persuade hospital administrators to modernise. But, of course, the major event of 1913 was the 17th International Congress of Medicine in London, held from Wednesday, August the 6th to Tuesday the 12th, under the presidency of Sir Thomas Barlow. In 1881, Osler had attended a previous such congress in London with his mentor, Palmer Howard of McGill. That congress was distinguished by the presence of Pasteur, Bastien, Lister, Huxley, Virchow and Koch. By 1913, all these men had gone, and the most visible giant fi figure of medicine to be seen was Oxford's Regis, though, as Cushing points out to us, probably the most picturesque attendee was a German from Frankfurt, Paul Ehrlich, the discoverer of Salvasan, who gave a memorable address on chemotherapy. He was to die a mere two years later, believing to his end that the Kaiser was an upholder of peace. As president of the section of medicine, Osler had been heavily involved in that section's organisation. Yet he found time on August the 5th, 1913, to attend a meeting of the International Association of Medical Museums in the Royal College of Surgeons. For the duration of the Congress, Sir William and Grace took a whole floor of the luxurious Browns Hotel in Albemarle Street, Mayfair. There they entertained friends every day for lunch, tea and dinner. I have tried several times to acquire full details of the Osler bookings from Browns, but sadly the records there have been lost. I do know, however, that amongst Osler's guests were Professor von Muller, along with his wife and daughter, K.F.J. Sudoff and others. Muller, incidentally, would have been the president of the next Congress, which had been scheduled for Munich in 1917, had the Great War not intervened. But Muller said anyway that the lavishness of the London event could never be equalled again. The Osler's generosity, particularly in entertaining and friendship, was a characteristic of their concern for their guests and international acquaintances. This, of course, had been demonstrated for many years in the hundreds of guests they invited to the open arms. On that particular subject, it is a tragedy that the visitor's book from 13 Norham Gardens has never been found. The Congress was a magnificent event. In a way, it resembled a modern medical Olympics. There were 7,000 delegates, a royal opening by Prince Arthur of Connaught, representing the King, to be followed by meetings of the various sections over the next week, 
in various sites around London. This set the tone. Barrow's Welcome and Company presented every delegate with a fine volume on the history of inoculation and vaccination, along with a list of all its company's products. Also, there were maps and train timetables donated. The social events were glittering additions to the sectional meetings, receptions, dinners, excursions, fates, conversaciones, and to add a touch of excitement, there was even a suffragette demonstration, quickly and enthusiastically quelled by London's bobbies. Osler's section of medicine met in the Royal Society of Medicine. On Wednesday, August the 6th, he held a dinner at 7.30 p.m. in the Royal Automobile Club in Pall Mall for 196 guests invited as reporters of discussions, readers of independent papers and officers of his section. We should note here that Oslo was a member of two London clubs, the Athenaeum and the RAC, both of which were near the then site of the Royal College of Physicians in Trafalgar Square. He'd been invited to join a very cerebral former club in 1906 and he, he used it regularly. With regard to the RAC, he was elected to it in September 1908. We know that f was the year from a letter in McGill from Grace Osler to Kate Cushing, stated 29th of April, that said that they had ordered a Renault car and that Dr Osler is very fond of motoring and does not mind going fast. That Renault arrived in August. It was a 14 horsepower Landau which ran along smartly at 20 miles an hour and most probably had been ordered from the Renault outlet at 21 Pall Mall. I looked at the RAC tables of prices for 1907 and 8 and the cost of such a Renault was between 380 and 540 pounds. The iconic picture here of the Oslers in the Renault setting out from Norham Gardens is a delight. It shows Revere on the front seat with the chauffeur on his right, as is appropriate in the UK, and there are Grace and William at the back. Michael Sedgwick, the automobile historian, has identified the car as a Renault of the, pre, of, of, of the 1906 to 1909 period. And this and Revere's appearance suggest the photo was taken also around 1908. It was almost inevitable that as an elite personage in Edwardian society, Osler would join the RAC. The RAC handbook for that year records that he was elected in September 1908. The records of the election meetings were destroyed in a wartime fire. But in the RAC archive at Churchill College, Cambridge, there is a reference to Osler's election. This slide shows his proposer and seconder. His proposer was Harry Edwin Bruce Bruce Porter, later Sir Harry, a physician at the Edward VII Hospital for Officers, who had a very fashionable West End medical practice and is allegedly the first doctor in England to adopt an automobile for professional work. His seconder was John Douglas Scott Montague, second Baron Montague of Bewley, a major figure in motoring, as well as being vice president of the RAC. I spent some considerable time trying to find the connections between Osler and his two proposers, particularly in the Bewley archive, but sadly have been unable to find any social or professional relationship. One thing is certain, Osler used the RAC regularly and even invited a student wishing to submit his MD thesis to meet him there. Sir William worked hard to organise his event in the RAC. Knowing the variety of his guests, he'd written to his Swiss friend Arnold Klebs, whom we saw earlier outside Louis' tomb, to ask him to save the day and the date 
and help him with the seating plan, as he knew so many of the guests. Following his medical degree from Basel in 1896, Klebs had done much work in the USA on tuberculosis, and while there had worked at Johns Hopkins with Osler, who inspired him in the history of medicine, and it, this started his journey as a historian, which led to the foundation in 1921 of the Society of the History of Swiss Medicine and Sciences. It was Klebs who took the picture of William and Revere Osler that adorns the frontispiece of the second volume of Cushing's masterly biography of Osler. The dinner in the great gallery of the RAC was a wondrous affair, and I have copies of the original documents showing the venue, the list of attendees with Osler's handwritten amendments, room organisation, table plans, menu and list of wines. Osler's table, number 11, was by the entrance to the great gallery. You can see by looking at the feast, the menu is unbelievably lavish. Um, the menu is mostly in French. The wines are superb. It must have cost a fortune. Now, Osler's table, number 11, contained these 10 people shown on the slide. There is not time to go through them, but you will notice the variety of places from whom his fellow guests came. For those who wish to peruse the list in greater detail, I had prepared laminates for circulation, but obviously this is no longer possible due to COVID-19. However, if anybody who would like them, I can circulate them if I'm emailed, and my email address appears on the last slide of this presentation in the acknowledgements. However, all of this information I tracked down with the excellent help of Trevor Dunmore, the RAC librarian, and Louise King of the RAC archive at Churchill College, Cambridge. Now, despite his presidency of the section of medicine and his entertaining in Browns and the RAC, Sir William also presented a paper at 3pm on Friday the 8th of August to the History of Medicine section, which met in the library of the RCP. Entitled Medical Literature as Illustrated in the Printed Books to 1480 AD, subsequently it was published in the BMJ in 1914, the Transactions of the Bibliographic Society in 1960, and then as Incunabula Medica in 1923. No medical congress outside the 1913 London event had ever been so widely reported, and the aftermath of this was many faceted. After Ehrlich's address on chemotherapy, there was an acceptance of the need for a royal commission to consider the menace of venereal disease. Additionally, Sir Henry Morris wrote to the Times on August the 13th, 1913, objecting to the views of some Congress speakers who wished to form whole time professional services in hospitals and medical schools. But from the Athenaeum that night, Osler wrote to the editor, rebuffing Morris's description of the head of a modern clinic as a jack of all trades. Osler suggested, let him visit Kyle at Heidelberg, Krauss or Hiss in Berlin, von Müller at Munich, or should he prefer a surgical clinic, that of the Mayo brothers at Rochester, Minnesota, and then he would better understand what organization under a jack of all trades means. He further suggested that a week or two at any of these clinics would make him a convert so far as hospital work was concerned. The Congress took an amazing amount of energy out of Sir William and from a recuperation holiday in Scotland he wrote to L.L. L. McCall 
We had a deuce of a business with this Congress and only just escaped alive. In the final part of this lecture, I just want to comment on other aspects of Osler's internationalism. In July 1910, Osler's president of the National Association for Prevention of Consumption and other forms of TB gave his presidential address, Man's Redemption of Man. It was a lay sermon given as part of a memorial service for Robert Koch, the discoverer of the tubercle bacillus, who had died several months earlier. The address took place in the McEwen Hall, Edinburgh, the city where Osler had failed to be elected as Lord Director of the University less than two years earlier. In a remarkable presentation displaying his wide knowledge of literature, ancient and modern, he looked at the progress of medicine from early Greek influences to his own day with optimism for the conquest of disease through medical research. And memorably, he repudiated the views of those who were opposing vaccination. We must recall that Osler lost his son Revere in World War I. He subsequently became a despairing optimist for the future of mankind. He knew there must be a very different civilization or there will be no civilization at all. He expressed this in his last and possibly greatest public lecture, his presidential address uh, delivered to the Classical Association in Oxford in May 1919. Entitled The Old Humanities and a New Science, its final paragraph expressed his hope that through the Hippocratic concepts of philanthropia, love of humanity, and philotechnia, love of science and technology, mankind might find the philosophia, wisdom, to continue and progress. And to me, this demonstrates the appropriateness of the use of Lee Hunt's quote, write me as one who loves his fellow man, which comes from Abu Ben Adam, one of Osler's favorite poems, and it appears on the tribute page of the Osler Memorial volume. His final lecture is remarkably philosophical considering that he'd previously commented that, like Oliver Edwards, Dr. Johnson's friend, he never mastered philosophy since cheerfulness was always breaking in. The memorial volume, published in 1926, was a bulletin of the International Association of Medical Museums, of which Sir William had been an enthusiastic supporter. It contains over 125 appreciations and reminiscences of Osler by colleagues around the world, and was edited by Maud Abbott, whose career path to distinction in congenital heart disease had been set by the man she now celebrated. These articles highlighted Osler's medical and historical scholarship, his major contributions to medical education and founding of societies, his humanity, generosity both financial and in dealings with colleagues and students, but above all, his cheer and friendship. Sir Arthur Keith commented that it was through Osler that the international medical wheels turned with an easy movement. Sir William had said that the only epitaph he wished was that he taught medical students on the wards. For many of us, a paraphrase of Dr Johnson's epitaph of Oliver Goldsmith is appropriate. He touched nothing that he did not adorn. His spirit lives in the multiple organisations and societies in North America, the UK, Argentina, China, Japan, Australia and New Zealand that bear his name. His Oxford home, 13 Norham Gardens, is not only a museum, but also an international think tank on health, which had five seminars to celebrate his death centenary on the theme of health and well-being, science and humanity are one a title arising from his last lecture. I hope that my lecture has illustrated that though Osler was distinguished through his working life in Montreal, Philadelphia, Baltimore and Oxford, 
he justifies Ludwig Aschoff's wider description of him as being an apostle of international medicine. His legacy endures. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Well, thank you, John, for your lecture that was not just comprehensive and authoritative, but timely. Timely, as we mark the centenary of the death of Sir William and evaluate his legacy in today's world. Timely in a world where national leaders strive to protect their borders, to be timely to be reminded of the importance of international collaboration in medical and scientific research and education, in addition to shared values and friendship. Osler's message to us all, enshrined in the title and subject matter of your lecture, could not be of greater relevance today as we struggle to deal with the pandemic that knows no borders. In closing this meeting, may I, on behalf of the British Society for the History of Medicine and today's audience, congratulate and thank you, John, for your excellent lecture. The traditional presentation of a plaque as a mark of our appreciation will have to wait for the day when we can meet again in person. Hopefully that day is not too far away. Can we show our appreciation, please, by virtual applause? Thank you, John. Good night, good day.